Hi, hello, my name is Ryan. Pokemon is a special series, and I hope that's not a surprise to you. This series has been going strong for nearly 30 years at this point, and we are now nine generations deep into this massively huge world, and I am three months deep into writing this script. But with something so massive as Pokemon, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of where such a large series began. This series is going to be tackling Pokemon generation by generation and talking about as many aspects as I have personal connection with up until we get to the current day. Now, this is not going to simply be me talking about the main series games and that be it. No. This is going to be as comprehensive as I can make it in one place, so we can keep it organized into nine and eventually more videos as more and more Pokemon media releases. Now, this video is long. You can see how long it is, and I'm even knowing it's going to be long writing this at the start here. I know this video is going to be long. The first generation of Pokemon is what hooked a lot of kids into the series, and those kids now are all adults, and man oh man I feel old, take me out back, put me out of my misery. Now some of the things we'll be talking about today will of course be the games, red, blue, and yellow, the anime, the trading card game, and also a bit of the music. Now there are other aspects of the first generation that I'm not going to be covering in this video, because I'm saving that for the second part of this video because this video ballooned much bigger than I thought it was going to, so I have to save some things for a part two. First and foremost, though, I want to delve into the history of Pokemon. So I'm not going to go super in-depth into this specific lesson here, as it's one that is told in many, many, many different videos out there, and they all tell the same facts. We get it. Pokemon began as the brainchild of Satoshi Tsuyuri, he came up with the idea first in 1989 while working with a video game fan magazine, Game Freak, with his colleague Ken Sugimori. There's plenty of public information about how Pokemon was inspired by Tajiri's love for insect collecting, and how it was also inspired by Ultraman. All that's been widely documented elsewhere, so we're going to move forward. Pokemon Red and Green took six years to develop, and eventually came out in the February of 1996. This game was a huge risk for Game Freak, and they were at their last legs in releasing this game. Pokemon wasn't their first game, as they were working on other games as Pokemon was being built in the background, but it was clear as soon as Pokemon hit its shelves, it was a huge middle of the road title. Pokemon Red and Green had quite a slow start, and it definitely was quite a surprise and relief when the sales of the series started to pick up. Now, these games are not the ones we ended up getting over here in the West, as the original Pokemon games actually got a second chance at a launch. Later in 1996 over in Japan, with the new Pokemon Blue version. Now, this was originally a mail and exclusive version you would get in Japan if you were a subscriber of the Korokoro magazine. Oh boy, I can't wait to talk about these guys a bit more in the future. But for now, it's just the method where you could get Pokemon Blue version before it was available for sale on the Japanese store shelves. Blue version is what our red and blue versions were based on, and they were based off of an even later development build with bug fixes and improved sprite art. Now, I think we have enough history class out of the way with that, so let's get into the more personal story. So, as of writing this, I'm 26 years old, almost 27. As of recording this, I am now 27. <laughs> Pokemon didn't come out here in the West until 1998, and while I don't have a story of waiting at the local game shop for my first copy of this new monster training RPG, I do have a lot of fond memories of my start with the series. My family was never well off. I grew up in upstate New York. For those outside of New York, you might imagine places like Manhattan or New York City when the words New York are uttered, but in truth we lived in the suburbs. Because of this, video games were usually something I played secondhand early on. It was around late 2000 when I was about 4 years old when my mom picked up a Game Boy Color for me. It had the translucent purple one, along with a copy of Pokemon Red. This by itself would probably be enough to make it for a game that resonated with me when I was younger. But what managed to sink this hook was a few facts. My best friend during this time, and still to this day, is my cousin, who I've mentioned more than a few times in videos on this channel. He's a year older than me, and we lived practically right across the street from one another growing up, and we played a lot of the same kind of games. I mentioned this in a video I uploaded on my older channel, but we had a very interesting relationship with the Pokemon series, where I would end up getting one version, and he'd end up getting the other. So I began when I got the red version, and he started with blue version. And to this day, whenever we name our rivals in games, my rival has the same name whenever possible. Luke. I played this game ad infinitum. 
It had grasped my attention in ways that few games at that point had, and getting to be able to befriend over 150 creatures, I couldn't even count that high back then. For this part of the video, I'm going to go over the original games, but I'll be using footage from a modern playthrough I did just for this series. Here, I'll talk about the team I chose to use for the playthrough, as well as my thoughts on the games going through it. Also, I will say I am playing a ROM of the original Pokemon Red, so this isn't the OG hardware as I haven't owned a Game Boy Color in almost 20 years, but I did, uh, throughout my playthrough, end up buying this cool retro emulation device called the Ambernick RG35X, and uh, this is built to look just like my old Game Boy Color, and it's super nifty, and I'm going to be continuing to play all of my future playthroughs on this. Uh, not sponsored, but would love to be. The one difference here, also I'm using a mod that changes the graphics of the game to be in full color, as if it were made for the Game Boy Color originally. There is a version of this mod that also updates the character and Pokemon sprites to their Gen 2 variants, but I didn't want to change too much of the Gen 1 experience, as I think the old art is tied close to with the original experience. But I did want to add at least a little touch of color wherever possible. Also, of note, this time in my life when I replayed these games the most is actually a few years down the road when the Game Boy Advance SP came out, as I was deep into the Pokemon rabbit hole as I am now. I played Red Version on my SP and did this cool little trick that you can do uh, where you can change the original color palette. So you could play the original games with a slick new cut of paint as it were. This was the original shiny Pokemon right here. So this would probably be the point in the video where I pop up my original copy of Pokemon Red that I kept pristine and I showed you the team that I first built and played through the game with. I'm talking about the history I had of my first ever team. But I did mention before I haven't owned a Game Boy in about 20 years. This is a bit of hyperbole, but an unfortunate truth is I have a younger sibling and they've had a bit of a history with losing or breaking games when they were younger. And since then we've lived in the aforementioned economic state we typically would share games for a period of time, so I no longer own the original red cartridge I first had, so as of late, I usually stick around to emulating them or playing these older games on the 3DS Virtual Console when they were available to purchase. Now obviously I'm going to be using my RG35X. While it is true I could play through this on a copy, as it could transfer my Pokemon up through the Pokemon Home Cloud service to bring them into the modern day games, I do have another plan for these teams, so I'll hold off on that for now. I am emulating this game, and I'm using this one for graphics mod, but also the rest of the game will be the basic Generation 1 experience. Today's all-new Pokémon will return in a moment on Kids WB! Pokémon are everywhere! They're invading! Each with powers more awesome than the next! Pokémon are burning with flame power! Their whirlwind power blows them away! Oh, no! There's nowhere to hide! Yikes! Can they be mastered? Pikachu? Yes. The more Pokemon you catch, the more powers you gain. You can put Pokemon power in your pocket. Gotta catch them all! Pokemon Ball Blasters, Battle Figures, Power Bouncers, and Talking Pokemon, each sold separately from Hasbro. There's a bowl of fun inside every can of Heinz Pokemon Pasta. It's your favorite Pokemon characters as fun-shaped noodles in a yummy Heinz tomato sauce. New Heinz Pokemon Pasta. Can you catch them all? Can you eat them all? With that preamble up and over, let's get started. Loading up the game, we're introduced to an iconic fight between a Nidorino and a Gengar, and man oh man, talk about a fight with a certain outcome. Easy sweep regardless, we load up and create a character. Red. For this experience, even though I'm going to be making this my personal journey, I intend to do something with the main teams here later. So this would be confusing if every main character was Ryan and every rival was named Luke. So we're just going to go and create the character Red. So here we are taking the spot of Red and going on the journey alongside our rival and next door neighbor, Blue. Starting out, there are some details I'd like to bring up about this world we live in. Entering our room, we have a Super Nintendo in our room. And this was a cool moment for me to see in a game because before this point, Games didn't try to be real life, at least the ones I played. It would have been foreign to me to see a Super Nintendo or a Game Boy in Mario 64 or Mario World. I had a Super Nintendo, again second hand, so I didn't have a lot of games that people had, but immediately being able to connect to a character like this was super neat. Next, you can get a potion if you go over to your PC and withdraw it. I didn't know this at the time, 
but this actually rounds back to a funny story I'll get to in just a moment. But now that we're going to head downstairs and greet our mom, it's a pretty recurrent theme that protagonists of Pokemon games are trying to have a mother and the father figure is typically not present. I won't go super into detail into this topic as it's still relevant to my current day life, but I related to this theme a lot too. My parents are flawed people in their own ways and I felt my situation echo to these games and felt like I wasn't alone when life at home got tough. I wasn't dealing with situations that a lot of people went through, but emotional detachment and feelings of having to raise yourself developmentally can fundamentally change who you are as a person. And having characters in the stories I grew up with being in these situations helped forge a future where I could be okay. Life is not a planned experience, and sometimes its hardest challenges are given to those least prepared to deal with them. I can't promise we won't go into heavy territory with me going through these games again. I said from the start that Pokemon is a very, very important series to me, and I think making the series is something I've been waiting to make since those days that I first came to know the series. Now, there is one detail I like in here too. In the movie that your mom is watching on the television, it talks about four boys walking in on railroad tracks. This movie, interestingly enough, is colloquially known as the movie Stand By Me, a 1986 adaptation of the Stephen King short story, The Body. <laughs> now, funnily enough, my interests would intersect with Stephen King's stories a bit later in my life. Big shoutouts to the Dark Tower series. I have not forgotten the face of my father. But with this set, we head out on our journey proper. Now, we got this first bit of tutorial in a sense here, as when we try to start our Pokemon adventure here in the world, our exploits are halted immediately, and we come across Professor Oak. He warns us it's too dangerous to go out into the world, grassy areas outside of Pallet Town without a Pokemon of our own, and suggests we follow him back into the lab, where his grandson Blue is waiting for his own choice of Pokemon. We get our introductory spiel, and can glean that Blue is an impatient and brash individual who we will see develop over the course of the game. Now, the starter choice is important here. Deciding what Pokemon you want to form a bond with and who you want accompanying you on your travels. But this is also a soft difficulty option, as these three Pokemon have quite the disproportionate differences that other starters may not have. Before going over each of them real quick, I want to explain how Pokemon stats work in a very general sense. Interesting note here is that stats in Pokemon have gone through a bit of an evolution since its inception, but we'll first go over how they first started. So we have a few different values here. HP, Attack, Defense, Special, and Speed. HP is your hit points, or health points. When these reach zero, your Pokémon can no longer fight. Attack is your physical attack, as the moves Pokémon can use can either be physical or special based on what type they are. Defense is your physical defense, so your defense against physical attacks. Special is a combination of your special attack and your special defense. And every game after this generation would split these into two different stats, but it's very important to know that these games have them combined into one, and this can drastically change how good some Pokémon are with this being so. And finally is the speed stat, which determines two things in this game. First is turn order. When you have two Pokémon out in the field, the one with the higher speed moves first, and in the case of a tie, a coin flip is run behind the scenes to decide who goes first. The second aspect of speed controls is one exclusive to this generation, are critical hits. The faster your Pokémon is, the higher chance they have of landing a critical hit. Critical hits are not uncommon in the RPG genre, but Pokémon handles them a little bit differently depending on which generation you're getting them in. In the first generation, critical hits are... interesting. The formula for calculating critical damage is right here, where L is the attacker's level. This basically means lower level Pokémon will have less significant critical hits as opposed to higher level Pokémon. For example, if a level 5 Pokémon gets a critical hit, its damage is about 1.5 times stronger than normal, whereas if the same Pokémon were level 95, then the boost would be about 1.95 times the normal damage. Critical hits also ignore all stat modifiers that Pokémon may have, so it's possible you could use a Pokémon with Sword Stance three times to max out your attack stat, and if you get a critical hit, it's possible you could be doing less damage overall because of the critical hit. A final note about critical hits is a funny bug that happens with them in this game, if you use the move Focus Energy, a move that is supposed to raise your chance to get a critical hit, it actually overloads the value and actually guarantees you will never get a critical hit if you use this move. Uh, what we're we talking about? The starters? Yeah. Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur are the iconic trio that have fan choice wars for years in the fandom. People love all three, and you can make a good case for any of these three starter Pokemon. Charmander evolves into Charmeleon and Charizard, and becomes a fast attacker using its pretty solid special stat. It's considered the hard mode of the game out of the gate, 
at least for the first start, as the first few gym leaders have type advantage against you. The Ken Sugimori art of Charizard is so iconic, I could fully understand why you would enjoy it. I do. And it makes no surprise that Charizard is one of my favorite Pokemon of all time. It also gets the flying type added onto it once it evolves fully, but admittedly this doesn't really help it all that much, as flying isn't the greatest type in these early games, so they don't have a lot of offensive or defensive presence, but you do lose the weakness for ground types. Bulbasaur here is the easy mode of the game, although again this is just for the beginning of the game as Bulbasaur has type advantage pretty early on, but as you go on it does face some more challenges by itself. Bulbasaur does, however, have another benefit helping toward new players, as when it evolves into Ivysaur, it'll evolve into Venusaur earlier than the other two starters will, as traditionally the others will evolve into their final form at level 36, but Ivysaur evolves into Venusaur at level 32. For design-wise, I think Venusaur's red and blue sprites are fine. They're not best, but they're not the worst. The green sprite is pretty... It's pretty tanky, having a pretty high special stat. It also gets poison as its subtype, as it evolves, and this is a bit of a double-edged sword, as it can hit other grass types easier. At least, it would if 99% of all the other grass type Pokemon in the game were also half poison type, so this is a benefit that really won't get to take advantage of. And it also has a new weakness to the psychic type, which is the most overpowered type in the game. Although, since there's only a few psychic types in the game, we actually won't face this as large of a problem as it might otherwise be. So it kind of balances out. And last but not least is Squirtle, who is a middle of the road option. It evolves into War Turtle, and then finally into Blastoise. Starting off with the design, I have to say Blastoise is a little bit of an anomaly. I love its green sprite, and its yellow sprite is really good too, but its red and blue sprites leave a lot to be desired. It looks like it's a little too chunky for its shell. Blastoise remains a pure water type, which is one of the best types in the game, and it's also one of the most populated species in the region. So even if you choose to not go Squirtle, you'll have plenty of options to go water type. Blastoise is very much a wall with its high stab being its physical defense, but also has a pretty respectable split between its physical and special attacks. And with its special being as high as it is, it means it also has a pretty respectable special defense as well as physical defense. Now with this out of the way, we can begin with our choice. And for this adventure, I chose Squirtle, and his name is Sebastian, as in from the sea and a bastion of defense. I want to also preface this with my fiance Hannah, as the one who is going to be providing the nicknames for my team this go-around, so all credit goes to her. I know we had a bit of a long detour there, getting to the adventure, but now we can move forward and get challenged by Blue for the very first time. He chooses this starter Pokemon that is strong against yours type-wise, and if it wasn't obvious, he, your three starters are a rock, paper, scissors formation, so it becomes a sort of balance. So Blue against me here has a Bulbasaur, and this was the kind of fight that walled me for a bit in my first playthrough. You see, early on your Pokemon has not a lot of diversify itself from others, as their move pools are extremely limited. So this early fight is basically me using Tackle against Bulbasaur, who itself will either use Tackle or attempt to use Growl to lower our attack. It is fully possible to lose this fight, and when I was younger I hated not being able to win it, so each time I lost, which was quite a lot, since I would try to use Tail Whip or Growl or whatever, to try to weaken the opponent when in reality the best strategy is just keep going on the offensive until you win, this is where we get that potion in the PC being helpful, as you can use it to heal when you get low on HP to secure the win. I like to try to keep the potion unused if I can help it, as it's much more helpful later on than right now. Once we're done with the fight, Oak has us head out to Viridian City to pick up a delivery order from the Pokemart there for him. And Blue acts his smug self tonight, he's going back home to get a town map from his sister Daisy, and he's gonna tell her to not give us one. Now if I cared, I would rush over to his house and get the town map ourselves, but since the town map is kinda lame, I'm gonna say pass. Here's what it looks like though, and in another well-known secret, this game takes place in the Kanto region, which is an analog to the Kanto region of Japan. The Kanto region is pretty big, especially for a Game Boy game, and it offers points of non-linearity segments, which is also pretty progressive for a Game Boy game. I'm going to be following the path I always follow, so I hope I ruffle some feathers with the <coughs> cannon order. Heading out to Viridian City, we arrive on Route 1, and we see it's very short, and it's just meant to teach us about ledges and wild grass as Pokemon will jump us in random encounters here, and we can listen to the wild battle theme for the first time. It's honestly a classic, and the soundtrack of this game is super nostalgic for me, 
so I'm going to praise the best songs as we come along for them. Speaking of great songs, I wanted to mention Palatown that we are in as a perfect starting town song. Also, as a quick side tangent, the town names in this game all follow the theme of colors. Palette Town is named after an art palette, and we move up to Viridian City. Viridian is a shade of green that starts us off on our journey. Viridian Town's theme is equally good, and I highly recommend you search up the Pokemon Evolution's orchestration of this game's music. It is really good. We head to the Pokemart and pick up the goods and skedaddle back down to Palette Town to deliver goods back to Oak. Here, in return, we get given the Pokedex, and are told to fulfill Oak's wish to complete the Pokedex by catching and evolving every Pokemon available in space. And I'm gonna be blunt, I rarely do this task, because rarely is the reward for doing such worth it to convince my brain to manage to do it. In this game, the reward for completing the Pokedex is a digital diploma congratulating you on the effort, and my brain can do a lot of things, but doing this, especially for each game we're gonna go through, that's not happening. I wanted to get these videos out sometime this decade. So I'll catch the Pokemon for my team, Pokemon of interest, and the legendaries, and that's about as far as I'll go. Good? Good. Now we're free to move out to our adventure proper and heading out to Route 1 once more because we're going to be catching a new friend. Enter Pidgey. Now I know I said flying types are not that great, but counterpoint, Pidgey is really cool. Okay, so I catch Pidgey, and Hannah names him Weasley. Now, I have to say, quick, Pokemon genders are not a thing in this game, so I'm headcanoning my entire team as non-binary. Now, I know I'm in the minority here, but I tend to dig the grind of earlier Pokemon games as they allow me kind of time to be brainless for a bit, and enjoy multitasking, listening to a podcast, or watching YouTube videos, or listening to audiobooks. I chill a bit as I train Weasley up a bit, and then get them and Sebastian up to about level 10. Weasley is okay-ish, but it is very fast, so I hope it'll at least do a fair amount of critical hits. It does have pretty respectable stats otherwise, and in the future games, we'll do a bit better off. Next up, we can head out west of Viridian City and reach Route 22. Ah, uh, something tells me that's not how numbers work. Well, in reality, it's because this route is like a sneak peek toward the end of the game, as the Pokemon League we're traveling toward is down this route, although we can't access it without the 8 badges of the Kanto Gym System. We can do some things of interest here though. First and foremost is catching my third new friend, Parsnip the Nidoran. Now Nidoran is one of my favorite designs of this generation. I also remember having this old Nido King figure and I remember bringing it into school one day because it was cool to bring Pokemon toys back to school back then. And I got curious and <laughs> kind of accidentally defaced the back of the bus seat with the Nido King's horn and the color of the toy was immediately deposited onto the seat and it came away white as sin. Anyway, Nidoran is cool because it evolves into Nidorino really early around level 16. And if we have the item to evolve at the Moonstone, we can evolve immediately into Nido King. One last thing about Pokemon that evolve with evolutionary stones is you have to keep in mind that as soon as you use an evolutionary stone, the Pokemon will no longer learn any moves via level up. In other games, this can kill a Pokemon's viability if you do it too early. This isn't a huge problem in Red and Blue, and wanna know why? One, Pokemon's level up learn sets in Red and Blue are dog shit anyway so you're not going to miss anything anyway. You'd be hard pressed to find any Pokemon that has a good level up learn set. They're all bad. And two, Pokemon have an ungodly amount of TMs they can learn, and not all of them would make any sense in any other game. Lots of Pokemon learn moves via TM you wouldn't normally think they could in this game. So what might otherwise be rough and kill a Pokemon's viability can actually be a super early path to becoming a really solid Pokemon. So we got three team members so far, and we can test out their new capabilities as heading out. We have a new fight against Blue here, but he's an easy enough beat as he only caught a Pidgey and since we last seen him. I mean, it has only been a few minutes, but I've been able to get the levels up, so come on man, you're lagging behind. Taking our victory in stride, we head north toward Route 2, and very quickly heading towards the Viridian Woods. This is our first dungeon here, and we're going to see early on that dungeons in this game are another word for maze. Wild Pokemon are plentiful here with large swaths of grass for encounters, and there are also trainers aplenty to face and get experience from. The most notable thing about the Viridian Forest, though, is the elusive Pikachu, which you can find if you're lucky enough. Pikachu is not immediately helpful for our first gym challenge coming up, but it is pretty helpful for the second gym we'll find a little bit later on. I did not come across a Pikachu, and I wasn't going to spend any extra time hunting it down. You can also find Pokemon like Caterpie and Weedle families here, 
which I would be tempted to use, but I already have three team members this early on, which is a bit of a risk for the spread of experience. The more team members you have, the lower average level your team will be. I will note though, Kanto does have an influx of trainer battles per route, so this won't be as much of an issue as it would be in other regions. We exit the Viridian Forest and arrive on the back stretch of Route 2, and here we enter Pewter City. Pewter is a grey color which fits the town's theme of rock type specialties. Of note, there is a museum in the back of town where you can pay a small fee to enter and learn about the local culture. They have interesting fossils on display here that have been unearthed from the local Mount Moon. Other than that, it's time to take on our first gym challenge. I'm not going to go into such a granular level to talk about each specific trainer we go against. As you've noticed, we've gone after a bit of bird's eye view around this, so we're going to challenge Brock. Brock challenges us with rock type Pokemon, but it's interesting that in this game, every single rock type Pokemon is also a ground type Pokemon, so they're unaffected by electric type moves. This led to many a playground discussions how rock types were invulnerable to electric type as well. Color us confused when actual pure rock type Pokemon were released, like Nosepass or Cranny Dose, and electricity worked on them just fine. It's funny though, because none of Brock's Pokemon in this game actually know any rock type moves, although that's not to say they can't be deadly, as Brock's Onyx has the move Bide, which stores energy for two turns and then unleashes a counterattack that does double of whatever damage you did to it in that time. Since Onyx has a massive physical defense stat, unless you have Squirtle or Bulbasaur on the field, and using the respective super effective attack on Onyx, this could put you in a bind. Important trainers like gym leaders have items at their disposal as well to heal, or use if they need to in a pinch, heightening the advantage they would have against you, as opposed to normal trainers. But it's of interesting note that Brock is the only trainer in this series that carries more than 4 items to use at his disposal. But unlike other gym leaders, he's not packing potions, but instead full heals to prevent his Pokemon from having status conditions placed on them. So if you caught a Caterpie out in the forest and think that using poison powder would be the way to victory, well, it's not impossible, but you'll have to exhaust all five of Brock's full heals in order to accomplish the strategy. A final interesting note here on Brock in the games is that originally Brock was designed to be the second gym leader, as shown by some design documents drawn up by Ken Sugimori himself showing a beta design of the first gym leader, and then showing Brock and Misty in place of gyms 2 and 3. It's likely that the gym you passed by in Viridian was originally going to be the first gym instead of the last. Anyway, since we have Sebastian here, Brock is very easy to take down as both of the Pokemon have a low special defense. We take our boulder badge and get a very interesting buff that is not seen in many Pokemon games. But in this game, if you obtain certain badges, you'll get a boost in your Pokemon stats. The text Brock says after this battle is kind of vague, but I'll go over it into more detail. As after obtaining the Boulder Badge, it means that in any single battle we participate from here on out, basically nothing in multiplayer, our Pokemon's attack stats are now increased by 12.5%. There's also an interesting glitch that happens here where this badge boost is reapplied whenever your Pokemon's stats are raised or lowered via moves in battle, but the stacking effect resets when the Pokemon levels up. Basically, this means our Pokemon are going to be packing a little bit more of a punch moving forward. All new Pokemon this weekend on Kids WB. Gotta catch all. Introducing Kraft Pokemon Macaroni and Cheese. Z Rex is searching high and low. Forcing cheesy Pokemon. On a nice up journey, only. It's a wacky macaroni. Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. Six new boxes, each with six of your favorite Pokemon shapes Pikachu, Meowth, Poliwhirl, Jigglypuff, Squirtle, and Charmander. I got it. It's the Pea and Cheesy Macaroni with new Kraft Pokemon. <laughs> Now, with one badge out of the way, we continue out east to Route 3, and mamma mia, that is a lot of trainers. Of note, there is a trainer here who has a pretty quotable message about how shorts are comfy and easy to wear. Clearing all these trainers out, we are able to get quite a few evolutions for our Pokémon. Parsnip evolves into a Nidorino, Sebastian evolves into a Wartortle, and Weasley evolves into a Pidgeotto. With that, we continue and head up toward the Pokémon Center outside of Mount Moon. Now, if you're so inclined, you can get a Magikarp here from a con man, uh, I mean, a totally fine and upstanding gentleman who will sell this one for 500 Poke. Magikarp is a really weak Pokemon with minimal combat ability, and whose main gimmick is that it's known to use the move Splash. Splash does nothing, and Magikarp is by extension useless. However, if you can deal with it long enough to get it to level 20, it'll evolve into the powerhouse that is Gyarados. 
Although it is to be noted that since water is considered special in this generation, Gyarados is able to take advantage of its 100 base special to wreak some havoc and utilize normal moves for its base 125 attack. This is a monster right here. But since I already have Sebastian as a water type, I decided not to go for the Gyarados. Mount Moon is dungeon number 2, and our first example of a cave dungeon. Here, there are no wild grass encounters, and instead Pokemon can fight you on every single tile. Trainers will pile on you, and items of plenty can be found inside. Here, when heading up to the upper left corner of the cave, I happen to find the rare encounter, Clefairy. I figure, I haven't used Clefairy in Generation 1, so here we go! Catching Clefairy, we give them the name Coo Whip. Now, normal types in Gen 1 are kinda nuts, because their move pools are just nuts. Case in point, in Mount Moon you can find the Tamper Water Gun, which Clefairy can learn. Also, I left Mount Moon real quick to get Coo Whip up to level with everybody else, but we do have an interesting problem now, as I have two Pokemon on my team who evolve using a Moonstone, Parsnip and Coo Whip, but I only remembered one Moonstone being available in Mount Moon easily. But I also then remembered that there was a hidden one you couldn't find on the lower levels of Mount Moon, so we'd be Gucci. Heading down to the basement, we encounter our first grunts of Team Rocket. Funnily enough, these guys have whips in their trainer art here, something I'm shocked made it past the sensors over here, especially since in early versions of planning these games, instead of badges, from gym leaders you'd collect belts, sort of like training belts that you collect in the martial arts, and that the idea would be to use the belts like a training whip. When it became very clear this idea seemed too cruel to the Pokemon themselves, they changed gears and went with badges instead. This did not stop the opposing trainer from having whips though. As we continue exploring through Mount Moon, I do recommend picking up a Paris, as I've done, as it's pretty helpful for learning some moves for hidden machines, or HMs that we'll get as we go on. HMs are special moves which you need a specific number of badges learned that can be able to use on the overworld to break through obstacles or traverse across the water. Anyway, I chose the name for our Paris here, calling them Kalos. Down on the bottom floor, we face some more rocket runs, and that little secret moonstone I alluded to before. Also, here we see a Pokemaniac who is guarding two uncovered fossils, and says he'll battle us for ownership of both fossils, but if we're able to win, he'll let us have one. One um, quick lesson out of the way, and we have a choice between us. These fossils can be revitalized into Pokemon from ancient times, much later in the game. There is the Dome Fossil and the Helix Fossil. I have a tiny inkling in the back of my head telling me to pick the Helix Fossil. Huh, wonder where that urge came from. Anyway. Each of these Pokemon are water rock type and aren't available until much later, so I'm not going to be adding them to the party. Before leaving Mount Moon for good, I decided to evolve both Parsnip and Coo Whip into their fully evolved forms, Nidoking and Clefable. I've also taken the liberty of outfitting Sebastian with Mega Punch, since we gave Thunder Wave and Water Gun to Coo Whip. Now leaving Mount Moon, we reach Route 4. Now if we were playing Blue version, then we could catch Sandshrew here, and he is the best boy of all time. It shouldn't be much of a secret. But Sandshrew and Sandslash are my full-on favorite Pokemon of all time, but since we're playing red version, we get Ekans and Arbok, which, while cool, are noticeably less cool than the alternative. Anyway, we move forward and head over east into Cerulean City. The music here is a bop. And a town by the water makes this distinction super simple as Cerulean is a shade of blue. Things of note here are this little bush down here in the south of town where, if you have a traded Pokemon that knows the HM for cut, you can entirely avoid leaving through the north of Cerulean once you have completed the gym challenge in this town. But exactly why that is we'll wait a bit more to explain. Before we tackle said gym, we're going to head north where we encounter blue once again, and here we have a battle that can catch you off guard in a number of ways. One is Rattata, which is pack and quick attack. Rattata's speed is kind of decent, so it can have the possibility to land some critical hits. Also on the opposite end, Blue has an Abra here, which cannot hurt you. It only knows the move Teleport, which is an auto flee from wild battles. But this isn't a wild battle, so it does nothing to us. Now that over here, we have a gauntlet of battles ahead of us as we enter Route 24, otherwise dubbed the Nugget Bridge. Beat all the trainers here at the end, we're given an opportunity we can't refuse. Fun fact though, if you happen to lose this grunt, 
the game treats it as if you've beaten the grunt, so it effectively is the worst trainer in the series, as he's the only one who loses to you by beating you. And we canonically do win, and find even more trainers available on this route, like, oh my lord, there are so many here! And there's also something very interesting about two of them. First, though, I would recommend you clear out every trainer, except for the two important ones, which is this one right here, and this one right here. Now, for the trainer right here, we're not going to face him just yet. But if we manage to catch an Abra here in the wild, which is harder than you might think, since its only move is teleport, which means it'll auto-flee if it gets the chance to act, but if you can manage it, and you press start right as you walk into this trainer's line of sight, because of the input, the pause menu comes up before the encounter with the trainer, this will allow us to use teleport to return to Cerulean City. Once back in Cerulean City, you can travel back up to Route 24, and then into Route 25, to face this youngster Slowpoke. Now, we're doing this because when we teleported, the game still believes we're in a battle, so it's calculating all of the data it's normally calculating when you're in the overworld, but from the context of you being in a battle which means that the game data is being improperly loaded, and if we face this youngster who has a level 17 slowpoke, and then we teleport once more to return to Cerulean City, once we return and walk toward the Nugget Bridge, the pause menu opens itself. Then once you back out of the menu, you're thrown into a battle with a wild Mew. This method is known as the Long Range Trainer Glitch, or the Trainer Fly Glitch, as it can also be accomplished once you get the HM to fly. Now the reason why we needed to face this trainer for this orc is this glitch can be used to spawn in more Pokemon, and the Pokemon that's decided is based on a relationship of its index number, which is an internal categorization used to group Pokemon. It is commonly believed that the order of Pokemon and their index values are the order of creation within the game itself, as the Pokemon in the first index slot is Rhydon, which is famously known for being the first designed Pokemon. Another quick tangent with these index numbers is that in red and blue, there are 190 slots of Pokemon filled, which aligns with a quote from programmer Shigeki Morimoto, the creator of Mew, funnily enough, saying that originally there were plans to include 190 total Pokemon within red and green, but some of the Pokemon ended up being cut at the last minute. The data that remains are glitched entries of Pokemon dubbed Missing Number, or Missingo, which we'll discuss in a little bit of depth later on. But it is of note that each of these index slots for these Pokemon can be attributed to Pokemon that appeared in the next set of games, Gold and Silver, and we'll go over more of those in the next part. Now back to the index values as they relate to Mew. Mew's index value is 21. And we chose this trainer here with the Slowpoke because its special stat is 21. Which is what caused Mew to be summoned here as we close out of the menu. Now that we're digging a bit into the game's inner workings, I'm going to pull the scope back to return to our journey through the rest of this route. Coming back, we reach the end and we reach the house of the eclectic Pokemon researcher, Bill except he's turned himself into a Pokemon due to a mishap with his teleportation machine. We're able to help return him back to his normal state, and learn that he's the person responsible for the Pokemon storage system, or more simply put, the technology behind our ability to store Pokemon in the PC. You see, the teleportation in the system is responsible for all the Pokeballs of the Pokemon you catch being teleported to the storage system. After we finish helping him and speaking to him, he gives us a ticket for the SSN a luxury cruiser that is set to leave from the Vermilion City, as thanks for helping him out. Sweet! Now we can head back to down to Cerulean City, where we can tackle the gym. Technically, you can challenge the gym as soon as you enter Cerulean, but this battle can be a little tricky, so I opted to get all of the training at Nugget Bridge and beyond first. Beating some of the no-name trainers, we get to challenge Misty, the tomboy mermaid. Misty begins the battle with a Staryu, which is not a problem at all. Being Water-type, if you chose Trimander, we'll have some triple here, but you can catch some grass types north of Cerulean, such as Bellsprout or Oddish, depending on which version you're playing. Since we have Squirtle, now Warthurtle, we can win this War of Attrition and take it down. Not to mention our Q-Whip. After Staryu comes in in its evolved form, Starmie. This is a water and psychic type Pokemon that can pack a punch with its Bubble Beam attack. The later versions of this fight in remakes is a bit more of a pain, but thankfully here it has no psychic type moves available. We're able to win, and we obtain the Cascade Badge. Once we're done here, we can move forward, which we do by entering this home in the northeast section of Cerulean City, which has been ransacked by a Team Rocket grunt. The police are investigating the matter and are searching for the criminal, who is standing right outside the home he looted. After kicking his butt, we get the TM for Dig, which is pretty helpful for the upcoming gym in Vermilion City. Speaking of, we can head south toward Route 5. The only thing of note on this route is that it houses the daycare center, the daycare is a place where you can leave a Pokemon, and it'll gain experience equal to the number of steps you take. So one step is one experience point. 
it can be pretty helpful when you have a Pokemon you want to get cut up to your main team. One thing to keep in mind though is that any moves Pokemon attempts to learn will automatically be learned, replacing the earliest learned move and moving the other moves up one slot. Also, Pokemon that have HM moves cannot be placed in the daycare in these games. Now, the next thing we're going to do is go into this little building here instead of the south exit. Because if you attempt to go through the south, then you'll get blocked off because the guard is too thirsty. This small building here leads to an underground pass that travels underneath the city that would be traveling if this guard had brought his Sunny D to work. So it goes through Saffron City and straight to Vermilion. Now, this is something that always screws with my mental image of Kanto because my brain likes to assume that Vermilion is directly south of Cerulean, but in reality, Saffron is Saffron, which right in between. Anyway, we fight some more trainers and make it to Vermilion City. Vermilion is an orange-red pigment, which is closer kind of to red, but it derives from the Mercury Sulfide Cinnabar, which, spoiler alert, is another name of a place in-game, so that counts more as red than this does. Inside Vermilion, we can head over to the Pokemon Fan Club, where we can obtain a bike voucher. Now, I didn't explain it when we were in Cerulean, but there is a bike shop that sells a bike for an impossible-to-obtain price. But if you give them this bike voucher, you can get it for free. The bike isn't required for you to beat the game, but it is if you want to go on the cycling road later on. Now heading back to Vermilion, the next thing we can do is check out the route east in the cave just before such. The cave is called Diglett's Tunnel, and you can find Diglett here. Shocker, you can also find Wild Dug Trio, which are a bit rarer, but if you're struggling against the next gym leader, this is an easy get out of jail free card, as both Diglett and Dug Trio are immune to all electric type attacks. The tunnel ends out south of Pewter City, but you can't move any further until we get the HM for cut, which we'll get to shortly. The route right of Vermilion is Route 11, and it features some new trainers. One thing I want to point out is on this route you can obtain Wild Drowsy, who in this game is really, really good because of the special stat being one stat. Drowsy evolves into Hypno, and is easier to deal with version of Abra, as it doesn't start out with only Teleport, and its stats are only slightly lower. And with Psychic being the best type in the game, you can build something really strong here out of the gate. So our only method of exploration left to us is to use the pass from Bill to board the SSM. Here we have a lot of trainers we can fight, but it's important to know that these trainers can only be fought while you're on the SSM now, as after we leave the ship shall leave forever. I decided to fight them all. Near the end of our exploits of the ship, we have another battle with our rival, Blue. He's a little bit more of a threat this time around, since his previously useless Abra has evolved into a Kadabra, and his Raditza has evolved into a Raticate and now his team has some more firepower behind it. We're able to kick him to the curb again, and we find in the next room the captain of the ship who's experiencing a bout of seasickness. We give him a little pat on the back and he's magically cured, giving us the attempt for cut in return for the help. Now that we have cut, we can leave the ship behind and head for the gym. But You can't catch all 150 Pokemon by yourself. So close. You need a friend to train with. So you can grab a link cable and a friend with a Game Boy, and with both packs you can catch them all. Got ya! And now, back to Pokemon on Kids WB! Kids WB is giving away 100 prizes a day on the Gotta Win Em All Pokéthon sweepstakes, and today's Poké Prize is... A Pokédex Organizer! On a postcard, write down today's prize and any three Pokémon you see in today's shows with your name, address, age, and phone number. And mail to Gotta Win Em All Pokéthon Sweepstakes, P.O. Box 2002, Ojai, California, 93024. It's your chance to win and qualify for one of five grand prizes that include... Oh, 166 Pokémon Trading Card Game Cards! Stay tuned for more chances to win Poké Prizes! Only on Kids WB! If, before you step onto the SSN, you trade a Pokémon that knows Cut, you can actually skip going to the ship entirely and go straight to the gym. Why would we do this? We'll wait until we get the HM for Surf to figure that out. But for those not in the know, I'll leave it as a mystery right now. Entering the Vermilion Gym, and we get the worst puzzle in the series. <sighs> I hate this. This puzzle appears in four different generations, and they have not changed it a single time, and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. So you have to find a switch in one of these garbage cans that is randomly chosen when you enter the room. But the first switch can only be one of these cans that are highlighted in red. Now, that's fine, the issue is that when you find the first switch, you have one chance to find the second switch, which is always adjacent to that can. Unless it chooses to be at the top left can, it's just not even adjacent to you, but that's only a chance. And if you choose wrong, then all the cans switch off and re-randomize their locations. 
it is possible to be here for way longer than you think because you keep getting unlucky, or it happens to be this top left switch arbitrarily. I hate this. Thankfully, it is now over and we can challenge Lieutenant Surge, the American Army General. This is kind of weird to have in the Japanese region, but it's kind of possible that Vermilion City is inspired by Yokosuka, a Japanese city with a U.S. Navy base inside it. Now, Lieutenant Surge also makes reference to an old war that he served in, and his partner Pokemon that served with him. Now, there are theories about this, and the lack of adult men in the Kanzo region compared to other demographics is because of this war. And this war isn't specified, so it's more background lore and world building, but it is interesting to take note of. Now, the battle against Lieutenant Surge himself can be a little tricky if you've started with Squirtle like myself. Starting off, he has a Voltorb, which is a very fast Pokemon, speed being something that all Electro-type Pokemon have in common. I would definitely come prepared for that. Now, Voltorb doesn't have any Electro-type moves, but it does have a move of concern called Sonic Boom. This move always does 20 HP no matter what. So if you're using a Pokemon that has lower HP, this can be dangerous. Next up is Pikachu, who has a priority move in Quick Attack. So even if you're faster, if he decides to use that move, he'll go first no matter what. Pikachu does have Thundershock, so it can hit for electric damage, but it's not too bad, as it's not that strong. It can also paralyze you using Thunder Wave, which is probably the most annoying tool it has in its tool belt. Then we finally get to the big boy, Raichu. Raichu trades its ability to use Thunder Wave for a more powerful attack with Thunderbolt. This is one of the best moves in the game bar none. It's based 90 power with 100 accuracy. The only stronger electric type move in this game is Thunder, which is 120 power for 70 accuracy. And honestly, the sacrifice in power for the guaranteed accuracy is worth it. That means if Raichu manages to fire it off, then you're going to be in some trouble. Unless you have a ground type. Parse step comes in clutch during this battle as Raichu is completely unable to touch it, as it does not have quick attack like Pikachu does. With this victory, we obtain the Thunder Badge, and this gives us another badge boost for... Defense. That's not what I would have thought it would bet for, but oh well, we can move on now. With Cut, we can use that shortcut back to Pewter City if we so wanted to. I don't believe anything is there that we need, but we do have something I would consider as close to necessary as possible by heading south from the exit of Diglett Tunnel. If you've caught 10 different kinds of Pokemon, then Professor Oak's aid will give us the HM for Flash. Now, by catch 10 different species, they mean have 10 different species registered to your Pokedex. So if you get Squirtle given to you at the beginning of the game, then evolve into War Turtle, we count that as 2. Now we have exactly 10 with all of our Pokemon and their evolutions, so we're able to get Flash. What Flash does is illuminates a dark area to make exploring possible. Now, there's only one area in this game that is dark that would necessitate such a move, and what do you know, we're headed directly toward it next. You might think we have nowhere else to go, as all other routes are blocked off to us, and any new places we can go just brings us back to where we were, but if we head back to Cerulean City, we can see there is a bush we can cut on the city's eastern exit, which leads out to Route 9. This route is full of rocky terrain and ledges with a plenty of budget trainers to fight. Now while we're here, I do want to mention that in yellow version there is a trainer here who says I'll have to start his 100 match win streak again. I'll bring this back up a bit later why that's neat. There are some more version differences in yellow that I haven't gone over yet, I hear you, and I'll be talking about them very shortly. There is one change I want to wait till we experience before we talk about them more. Heading eastward more we reach route 10 as we head south. There's a waterfront here we can't do anything with, and we have the Rock Tunnel. This is my least favorite dungeon in the series, and it's because it's the one dungeon I would say Flash is required, because unless you have nothing better to do, dark caves in this generation completely blind you, and can't tell where you are at any given point, and Flash is such a low availability move. Fun fact, I caught a Paris as in the future generations can learn Flash and Cut, so it's good Pokemon to house your utility moves on, but I didn't realize that Paris can't learn Flash in this generation. Yay! Anyway, this is another maze full of trainers, and it's interesting that some of the trainers here have starter Pokemon. As in red and blue, you don't see the starter Pokemon outside of your rival battle until now. When you finally make it through to the other side, we reach the back end of Route 10. Interestingly enough, there is a trainer here who wishes that a pink Pokemon with a floral pattern could exist. We'll run back on this much later. Next, we move south and enter Lavender Town. Now, who boy, this is the town that if you are in somewhat aware of Pokemon, this series surrounding Lavender Town. So I'm not going to go super into depth with this, but I do want to highlight that it was a very significant experience with this game's lifespan. Lavender Town is the spooky town of Kanto. It features a seven-story high cemetery, the logistics of which I'm not going to get begin to understand, but since lavender is a purplish color, the more ghostly association makes sense. Heck, there's even a young child who confirms there's a white hand on your shoulder. 
if we tell her we don't believe in ghosts. The biggest thing about Lavender Town, though, is the music. This song is infamous for giving nightmares to children across the world. There is even a creepypasta that is widely known about this track titled The Lavender Town Syndrome. I should preface this that the story is completely fictional, but it does contain sensitive material, so be warned. Anyway, it wrote of an uptick of suicides and illnesses in children between the ages of 7 and 12, after the initial release of Red and Green in Japan. The rumor said the suicides would only start once the player reached Lavender Town, as their younger brains were affected by the original version of the theme that had higher frequencies that only children and young teens could hear, since their ears were more sensitive. According to the story, around 200 children reportedly committed suicide, and many more developed illnesses and other adverse afflictions. The reports of the suicides were pretty graphic. You can imagine the methods described, but of course this was all made up, so none of it actually happened. It was reported in the creepypasta that the international release had edited the Lavender Town theme to disclude these higher frequencies. But this claim was refuted as the internet aged, and it was in fact easier to fact check this. No changes were made to the Lavender House theme between the original Red and Green release and the version that appeared in Red, Blue, or Yellow overseas. Funnily enough, a video in 2010 was credited that tried to pair with the creepypasta to prove its validity of the song's haunted nature by showing a spectrogram of the original audio, as said by the user. I'll show this clip from the Lavender Town Myths video by Jaywitz, because honestly I had a bit of trouble tracking down the original video, and I want to show my support to Jaywitz at least once in this video, as his content is a continuous inspiration for me. The Missing Frequencies This is another story meant to complement and explain the results of Lavender Town Syndrome. The idea surfaced from a YouTube video posted about two years ago where the user Intral claimed that when you run the original Lavender Town theme into a spectrogram, the resulting image reveals the Pokemon Go sprite, along with the unknown letters saying, Leave Now. The video description tells a story about how the poster's friend died while playing through his old version, shortly after searching through the game's data on his computer, searching through the game's music files. The user claims that he added some missing frequencies into the Lavender Town theme song that couldn't have been handled by the original Game Boy. But again, this story's garbage. With the right audio tools, it's easy to convert any image into a song's data for music as a spectrogram to hear. Aphex Twin did it back over a decade ago in his song Wind Licker. And before you get too freaked out at this image, it's not a ghost, demon, or anything else. The picture is straight from one of his album covers. No, not that one. Well, there's the second time I'm in with Breast found his way onto my videos. This cover. With the right equipment, you can add anything you want into a song, even a ghost sprite and some unknown letters. It's funny, but because in this supposed haunted tune, we have an image of Pokemon Unknown spelling out Leave Now. Except the Pokemon Unknown was not officially made into a Pokemon until the Generation 2 games dropped, Gold, Silver, and Crystal. So there's no way that these could have been coded into the music. And I know that there were about 40 Pokemon from the next generation that have remnant data left over in the index numbers, but none of these Pokemon are unknown. So even if that were somehow the case, it just flat out doesn't work logically. Now, with all these facts and logic, that doesn't stop the entirety of Lavender Town from scaring the actual balls off my childhood self. I was terrified of this place, and I lapped up every single horror story about it. I believe Lavender Town and the entirety of Zelda Majora's Mask are the two greatest influences for me creating horror as an adult. Interestingly though, with all of this hoax and fiction nonsense, there was actually a different version of this theme like the story says, that does have high pitch frequencies in it. I'll play a little bit of that here. Now I'm also going to recommend the rest of that Lavender Town Myths video by Jaywitz, and we'll link it in the description, as the rest of the stories, and even fan games made about this specific topic are worth the read and watch. But I don't want to bog down this video with all the hyper-realistic blood. Anyway, here in Lavender Town we have a few things of note. First and foremost is the Name Raider, where if you accidentally press B too fast as you were catching your Pokemon and skipped giving it a nickname, here you go! Next is that seven-story tall cemetery I mentioned. 
I know I said I wasn't going to question it, but I can't let that slide. We have a building with multiple stories that each floor has you graves that you're digging into the floor. Ah, uh, anyway. Heading up to the first floor, we have another fight with Blue here. He stitched his Raticate for a Growlithe and a Gyarados. Fan theory would suggest his Raticate is dead because of the language he uses here. I'm going to leave that there and say we kick his butt. Now, as you continue to explore here, you'll see that all the wild Pokemon here you can't fight, catch, or do anything with. If you continue up the top of the tower, you'll see that there's a boss encounter with one of these ghosts. So we can't progress here any further. We have two paths we can travel down. The south leads us to Route 12. But if you continue to go this way, you'll end up being blocked by that large Pokemon that blocked us near Vermilion. So, heading west to Route 8 is our way to go. This route here has another trainer you can perform the long range trainer glitch. This gambler here early on, but you'll need VHM for a fly if you want to make it back to Cerulean. At least, unless the Cerulean Pokemon Center was the last Pokemon Center you stopped at if you're using Teleport. Which is pretty tough to not break the habit if you've just gone through Rock Tunnel again. All in all, it's probably just best to use the other trainers past the Nugget Bridge. Also on this route is a patch of grass that's accessible if you have cut, and if you do access it, you can encounter either Growlithe if you're playing red version, or Vulpix if you're playing blue version. Nowadays in modern Pokemon, Growlithe is the much better fire type. Two stage Mon, as Arcanine has access to some of the best abilities in the game, and a solid move pool with real good stats, while Ninetales has not as great stats, not as great of a move pool, and not as great of an ability. However, here in the first generation where half of these don't exist, Vulpix is actually the superior Pokemon. This is another case of because special is one stat, this Pokemon is really good. Both of them will evolve via the Firestone item, which can be purchased in the next city. But be warned, any Pokemon that evolves by an Evolution Stone will not naturally learn any more moves. They can only learn new moves from TMs or HMs. So it'd be smart to keep it a Vulpix until you learn all the moves you wanted to learn, if so. I'm not going to be getting Growlithe, as I plan on using another fire type real soon, so I continue to fight the crazy amount of trainers on this route, and head west to another underground path. This underground path travels underneath Saffron City, similar to how the other one went underground connecting Cerulean and Vermilion. This one brings us towards Celadon City. Celadon as a color is a pale blue-green color, obviously focusing more on the green aspect as its gym leader, Erica, specializes in the grass type. There are a lot of things in Celadon to do, such as visiting the department store, which is stacks upon stacks upon stacks of stores, with lots of items available to purchase that aren't normally available anywhere else. And also a TM store, which has quite a few TMs for sale. Not necessarily the greatest moves, but there are some good ones like Submission or Mega Punch. I pick up a Firestone here and also give some drinks to this little girl in exchange for some really killer teams. Mainly Ice Beam and Shry Attack. Ice Beam is the ice equivalent to Thunderbolt, 90 base power with 100 accuracy and a chance to freeze the opponent. Frozen is a status condition that is actually broken in this generation, where if you freeze an opponent's Pokemon, there's virtually no way to be thought out. You can use an Ice Heal but no opponents in the game are ever coded to use an Ice Heal, or if you use a Fire-type move against the opponent and that Fire-type move has a chance of burning, so basically any Fire-type move save for Fire Spin. Otherwise, they're boned. Similarly, if you are frozen, the same applies to you. Tri attack is an 80 power normal type move. I actually taught this move had the same effect it does in later generations where it has a 20% chance to burn, paralyze, or freeze the opponent, but it turns out it has no secondary effect in this game. But it's still an 80 power move, so that's still a good thing for Q Whip to have. Before we leave the department store, I'm gonna pick up another drink as we can give this to those guards that give us access to Saffron City. Next, we're gonna head over to the Celadon Condominiums, which has two important things for us. First things first, on the front entrance we can see a room reserved by Game Freak staff. They have their own in-universe avatars, and honestly, this is pretty cool. If you're able to complete the Pokedex, that is, register all 150 Pokemon Pokedex, not counting Mew, you can get that digital diploma here celebrating your achievement. That's cool and all, but nothing really material for us. What is material, however, is if we exit and then go out to the back exit and reach the top of the condominiums, we can find a lone Pokeball that contains Eevee. Eevee is a special Pokemon. While nowadays it's seen as sort of a secondary mascot for the series alongside Pikachu, it never used to be that way. But it was still special nonetheless. See, Eevee by itself is a pretty average normal type Pokemon that doesn't do a whole lot great. 
but its talent lies in its multiple Pokemon it can evolve into. In this generation, Eevee can evolve into either Vaporeon, Jolteon, or Flareon, based on what type of stone you use to evolve it, which coincidentally can be caught in the Celadon store. My favorite was always Vaporeon of the original three, because I like using tanky water type Pokemon, but this time I decided to put my Firestone to good use and evolve Eevee into Flareon. Oh, also, I named my Eevee Coffee Eevee, because a certain typo lives in my brain rent free. I know I made the whole PSA to avoid evolving your stone evolution Pokemon right away, but in this case it's fine because Eevee isn't going to learn any water, electric, or fire type moves naturally, so I'm going to be outfitting its moveset with TMs anyhow. Speaking of, we're next going to head to the Celadon Game Corner, but not before picking up a coin case from the nearby restaurant which allows us to carry the Game Corner special currency. Game Corner is a casino for all intents and purposes, and modern versions of Pokemon do not have these as they violate more recent European laws about gambling and video games, but while they're here I can say that these never fully interested me. I'm impatient so slots were never fun for me in these games, and for this generation you have two methods of earning coins, slots or buying coins with your infinite cash. Now, I don't have infinite time, nor does this game have methods of grinding money, so I cheated to get this infinite money, because I would like my Flareon to have Hyper Beam, because right now its moveset is Doggy Doo Doo. If you have a problem with this, I would love to hear about it in the problem comments below. Anyway, there are other options to get with coins, such as some rare Pokemon. Here you can get the Pokemon Scyther in red version, or Pinsir in blue version early, as normally they'd only be obtainable in the Safari Zone in Fuchsia City. Both of these are really cool Pokemon, but <laughs> like many Pokemon in this generation, their movesets are Doggy Doo Doo, so be prepared to not do a whole lot with them. But Scyther is a bit better than Pinsir moveset wise. The unique Pokemon Porygon is exclusive to this game corner here for a crazy amount of coins. It's kinda neat, but doesn't it have anything really crazy going for it? It's neat though. I'm just grabbing the Hyper Beam TM and moving forward to the gym. There's an old man standing outside who very clearly is peeping in on the people inside as the gym features entirely women trainers. So if this guy gets a bonk, heading inside, this is the one gym that requires an HM inside the gym itself being cut. Tackling down the gym trainers, they may face off against Erica. She is dubbed the nature loving princess and is known to collect Pokemon if she thinks they're cute. Erica has three Pokemon, and starting off is her Victory Bell. This thing is able to use Wrap to lock you to not be able to move for a number of turns, and then being able to put you to sleep or poison your Pokemon with the respective powder move. If you're able to finish it off, then you get a Break with Tangle, which only knows Construct and Bind. The absolute state of the 4D chess being played here. Finally, she runs a Vile Plume, which is the same powder moves as Victory Bell, but it also has Mega Drain to help restore its HP as well as Petal Bands, a strong grass type attack that locks it into using Petal Bands for 2 to 3 turns, upon which it'll confuse itself. Beating Erica nets us the Rainbow Badge, and the motivation to continue forward. Nobody knows every Pokemon! Master knows! Who weighs more? Metapod or Pidgeotto? Pidgeotto, by 44 pounds! Oh. Bulbasaur's height? Two feet, four inches. How does he do it? The electronic Pokedex for master trainers from Abra to Zubat. Master them all. Weedle's number? <laughs> Thirteen. 150 Pokemon with all the best fighting moves. Electronic Pokedex for master trainers. New from Tiger. 